Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 302 for the 24th of Elul in Alipir. So today is day two of two of my Hebrew birthday. For more information as to what I mean by that, what do I mean that I have two days of my birthday, uh, go back and listen to yesterday's episode where I explained all about it, the idea of being Hashmashos and Twilight and all of that. And so anyway, so seeing as it is the second day of my birthday, I'd like to once again take this opportunity to give all of you listeners a birthday blessing. It's taught that on your birthday, you have a special power given to you to uh, to give blessings because there's like sort of like the radiance of your specific life force, your vitality is shining, is radiant at that time. So I will take this opportunity to bless all of my listeners, all of you guys out there with a wonderful year, with a year of revealed gl- good, revealed blessings, overflowing blessings in all aspects of your life, all areas of your life with so much happiness, so much joy, and just tremendous abundance in every aspect of everything that you do every in your service of God spiritually in your physical material life anything you need and more so I hope it's a great year for you guys once again a, a good and sweet year I just recently learned that the reason why we say that we want the year we, we don't just wish people to have a good year but we wish them to have a good and sweet year is because as we've learned to Tanya many times Goodness is everywhere. Everything is ultimately good. Whether we perceive it to be good or not, it's always good because everything comes from God. Our entire life comes from God, but we don't always see it as such. We don't always perceive it as such. So when we wish people a sweet year, this is our our wish. This is our blessing to people that the year should not only just be good because it is going to be good because everything's good, but that it should be sweet as well. That we should really experience it and perceive it as being sweet. So all right, now that that's out of the way, <laughs> we can get into the Tanya of today. And t- and the Tanya of today, we um, are concluding Epistle 18 of uh, in, in Igeris HaKodesh of the Tanya. And today we're going to be talking about thirst, the idea of being thirsty, spiritually thirsty, being a seeker, being somebody who really yearns, wants more, isn't satisfied with life as it is. And we'll learn about how this is actually a very good thing to live in this state of thirst. And this is something that we should all aspire to. So yesterday, we talked about a certain type of love of God that's actually not granted to everybody. It's it's given as a gift, as a present to certain individuals, certain select individuals that God decides merit this type of love. And this type of love of God could be thought of as the quenching of the thirst. It could be thought of as being in a state where the, these, the, when people experience this love of God that we spoke about yesterday, they're just delighting. They, it's likened to delicacies. It's likened to really delicious food. So it's just like they're just like in this pleasurable state involving God. It's called the love of pleasures. Today, we're learning about a different type of love of God of God, the second type of love of God. And this is a type of love of God that we can all attain and that we should all attain. And that in fact is something that's actually innate to all of us as Jews. And it's something that we just, all we need to do is to tap into it and to, to uh, push away any distractions, which as we'll learn, there are many distractions that we come into contact with. And so this love of God that we can all attain and that we all really have, and we just need to uncover is likened to a thirst. It's likened to just really being thirsty, really realizing that we, what it is that we're lacking. And so one thing, maybe it's a stereotype of Jews, but Jews are by nature searchers. They're always looking for something. They're not satisfied. There's something not okay with their existence. Take the most secular Jew, the most religious Jew. They always want more. 
And this is really a reflection of the fact of this type of love of God. What they're really thirsting for is their, for their creator. They, it's almost there. It's, it's almost like you see the water, you, you're going for it. And then it's like a tease that somebody takes that water and takes it away one step, one step, one step. And you, you're almost, you just can't quite get to it. So that, that is what this love of God is all about, this thirst, this yearning. And what we'll learn about is that within all of us, while we all do innately have this love of God, and it's something we need to tap into, our service is to actually push aside any distractions that push us away from this love of God. And uh, going with this analogy that we've been discussing, this, this imagery that we've used in the past of a husband and wife, of a man and a woman, and the relationship there, here too, that imagery is brought up by the Alter Rebbe in the sense that what does he call these distractions that we experience? He calls them a mistress. He calls them the rival wife, the tzarat in Hebrew, which is kind of like vying for the attention of the husband when really it's not hers to get. And so we as Jews, and, and, and what this really is ultimately, what is this rival wife? What is this mistress inside of us? This is our animal soul. This is our klipa. This is the part of us that, again, if you go back to the beginning of Tanya, we talked about how we have two souls. We have two forces within us that are constantly battling within each other. This rival wife is the animal soul. This is the part of us that is just out there for our, for our own pleasure, for our own ego, for our own sense of of satisfaction, of indulgence, all of those kind of things. And so our job is to show this mistress, show this rival wife who's in charge, who's the woman of the house. And ultimately, I mean, ideally, we'd like to shut her up entirely or get rid of her, right? But that's not something, as we've learned, that we can all do. Unless we're tzaddikim, she's always going to be there. But we, the best we can do, really, for most of us, and that's actually a pretty high level, is to at least put her in her place. And she could have a role. We could use her at times when we need to eat, when we need to drink. These are things that help us in our service of God, help us get through life. So sure, at those times, great, great. You're feeling hungry, you're feeling thirsty, you, you want to sleep because you feel like you need energy. Good. We'll let you do that. We can let her have her time at in those moments because ultimately it's serving us as well because we know that if we get enough sleep, if we eat enough food, if we eat the right kinds of foods for us, if we if, if our body's happy, our soul's going to be happy and we're better going to be able to serve God. But we have to keep in mind who's in charge and we have to really try to, as best possible, not let this rival wife distract us too much from our ultimate purpose, from this thirst that we have. So in other words, if you're really thirsty for water, don't just drink Diet Coke. Don't just drink so soda, which may quench your thirst temporarily or might give you the semblance that you're quenching your thirst, but it's actually going to dehydrate you further. So drink the water. Don't drink the soda. That's the bottom line. So let's get into the text and see how the Ultra Rebbe explains all of this. And we can we discuss a little bit more as we go. So here we go. And again, once again, for context, we are in a, going to be concluding uh, epistle 18. This is the second half of epistle 18 of Iger Sakodesh today. And here we go. So the altar of it begins and he says that now we're going to talk about the second category of love. And this is the love and the desire of the soul that desires and loves to want to and wishes to cleave to God, to be bound in the bond of life. In Hebrew, that's mitzor b'tzor chaim. That's a, that's a citation from Shmuel Aleph chapter 25 verse 29 and the and it really wants to the soul really wants to be close to god and that is really what the whole desire of the soul is and it's bad for it it's it it doesn't feel good to be far away for, from god god forbid uh and by having an iron partition of the chitzonim, of the, the, the forces of the klipa, like the external forces that, that go against God, it's it, that if, if those forces are there, that God forbid, um, prevent, serve as a barrier between the soul and God, that's, that's really bad for the soul. The soul really doesn't like that. So to just kind of summarize that. So basically yesterday we spoke about the first category of love, which is the category of love, which is the avabata nogim, love of pleasures, which is where one loves God by way, it's like sort of like basking, indulging in the pleasurable aspect of God, where a person kind of is just like, you know, in the state, like I described of they're drinking the water, they're feeling good. It's like they're eating that steak, whatever it is, they're in the delight itself. Here we're talking about the second type of love is this type of love of today is this love of the the yearning, the desire, wanting to be close to God, 
not wanting to be far away from God. So it's not, it's like, it's, you haven't yet reached the destination. It's the pursuit. It's the, uh, the drive towards that thing. Um, so it's the, 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 the love of the, the, the wanting to get close, the yearning for that. And the altar prophet goes on and he says that this love, this love of the yearning of wanting to be close to God is actually hidden in all of the, the hearts of all Jews, even in Rashaim, even in wicked Jews. So if you want to go back and the technical definition of Rashaim, go back way, way, way before in the earlier parts of the Tanya where we actually defined all the different categories of Jews. So even in the category of Jews, which are considered to be Rashaim, quote unquote, which if you recall from that time, the category of Rashaim is pretty broad. It basically encompasses anybody who at any point does something against the will of God, whether in thought, speech, or action, even the smallest little thing. Like they're not totally in control of themselves. That's the basic idea of a wicked person. So that probably is most people in the world, most Jews even, unfortunately, because it's, you know, it's a very big thing to be in total control of all of your impulses. But so nevertheless, what the altar is saying is even in these Rishayim, even the Rishayim, and he doesn't specify which Rishayim, so that means even the really like wicked people, people who really just maybe a lot of their life is not being in control of themselves. They still have this, this innate love of God, this yearning to be close to God innate in their heart. And from this love, how does it manifest? It manifests in remorse. So, uh, so there's this idea. So it's like, you know, Jewish guilt, <laughs> Jewish guilt is a real thing. Basically the altar is saying, he's saying that this, uh, the, the way that this love manifests in Rashaim in wicked people is that it's going to come out as remorse that they, they're walking around they're, They may be doing things that are against the will of God, but they don't feel good about it. They feel remorseful. And the mere fact that they feel remorseful is due to the fact that they have this innate love of God within them. However, okay, so this love is hidden within them, right? So it's there, it's innate, but it's latent and it's in a concealed state and it's in a state of exile within the body. And so since it's in this state of exile, since it's in this hidden state, then the klipos can dominate it, can, can uh, control it. And this is the Ruach Shtut. This is the spirit of folly that causes a person to sin. So basically the ultra is explaining the fact as of why sin happens. Why do people go against the will of God? Because like, if you think about it logically, like if we all have this innate yearning to be close to God and to do what God wants, why would anybody at any time do something that's against the will of God? It doesn't make any sense, right? It's like if you love a person and you know that person is in the other room and the other person told you specifically what you can do to get close to them, that then they want to talk to you. They want to engage in conversation with you. They want to be close to you. Uh, like, would you, and you want to be close to them. Would you like Dafka do things that, um, that are mean to them? Like, would you be mean to this person? Would you do things to not be close to them? Like that doesn't make any sense, right? Or like if on a superficial level, let's say you love money, right? Like you, you love money, you know, money is going to be really good for you. Are you going to go then and like burn up dollar bills, like burn up your money? Like, why would you do something like that? So why is it? It's a very, very strong question. Why is it that Jews, if we innately love God, if we innately want to be close to God, we innately want to do God's will. Why do we ever go against the will of God? It doesn't make any sense. And so this is the explanation. The explanation is because yes, we all love God. Yes, our love is innate and it's there in every single Jew. However, it's latent, it's hidden. And because it's latent and hidden and it's in exile, that means that it's it's subject to the forces of the klipos. It's subject to these outside forces, these shells, these husks that conceal godliness. And this is why it can cause a person to get confused. It can cause a person to get to, um, to stray and get distracted from what it is they really like. So it's kind of like, uh, if you think about it in a, in a, one of those more mundane examples, we said, let's say if there's somebody in the other room who you really love and you really want to talk to, really cherish and all that stuff. But then on your way over to visiting them, there's some kind of like really big distraction. Like you see this like big carnival going on or something like that. So if you, depending on your mindset, maybe you'll still want to go and visit that person and overcome the carnival. But if the carnival is exciting enough, and if you kind of tell yourself like, you know what, I can visit my brother, my sister, my husband, my wife, anytime, what's the big deal? You know, we, you can rationalize things to yourself and you can get distracted with the carnival instead, right? 
when it comes to money, money's another good example. Everybody likes money, right? We all know that money is good for us, but we don't always spend our money wisely because sometimes we get ex- distracted. We sometimes do things that are like we don't make the wisest money choices. So like, for example, let's say somebody doesn't have a lot of money. They're kind of struggling to pay their bills. You see this all the time. Instead of being wise about their budget and take and figuring out like how much money they need to spend for groceries and that stuff, they're buying takeout food, which is because in the moment, Moment, they're really hungry and they just want to get something to eat when that's actually eating up their money more than it should be. So the same thing happens when it comes to our relationship with God. Deal. So it's like, yes, we want to be close to God. We want to, we want to connect with God. We want to cleave to God, but we get distracted because this love that we have is buried deep inside of us and it's latent. It's, it's hiding and it's an exile. So now that we know that this is what's going on, then The ultra bit continues and we see our work is basically laid out for us. What is our work? What is our service to our creator? Our service to our creator is to become stronger and to overcome these husks as much to in all of the ways that they manifest themselves. Meaning first to expel it completely from the body that so that it has no control over us at all, whether it's in thought, speech or action uh, and this is uh, and and this manifests in all of the organs of the body, the 248 organs of the body. And thus, after this, once we expel these forces, these clipos, these husks, which conceal godliness from within us, then we can have we can free the captive. We can free the um, rescue the princess, so to speak, from prison. We can free this godly spark of ourselves, this soul within ourselves. Um, with in with with a strong hand meaning to say that now you will become strong and and brave in your heart um amongst the heroes so that is a citation um that's a translation of a citation from Amos chapter 2 verse 16 in the Hebrew it's amidst libobe giburim so basically it's meaning to say that like now you can like shine like a hero like if if you really succeed in pushing out all of these clipos pushing out all of these extraneous distractions from within you, then you can shine and rise up like like a um, like a hero. So that this hidden love that is hidden will now become revealed with a great revelation in all of the different parts of the soul as it's found in the body. And the main thing says the ultra bet is in the mind and in the faculty of thought that's found inside of the brain because so that the such that the the mind will think about and will contemplate always um, things regarding their creator. So it's kind of all starts in the mind. So it's like once a person attains this, this level where they successfully expel these extraneous forces, this will cause them then the way this will manifest is primarily in the mind. This will be a person who thinks about God, who is um, uh, has a God consciousness in the way that they live their life and how God is the life force of of all life like he's the 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 source of all life in general and specifically to his soul so it's it's a very personal kind of relationship that the person is going to recognize that god is his god god is vivifying not only the entire world and everything in it and all worlds but specifically to him too specifically my world and this will cause a person to yearn and to desire to be attached to God and to be near to God with an innate yearning. So then it's like the innate yearning that we all have will come out, will will become manifest. Uh, like a child yearns to always be near their father. So if you look at little kids, right, it's like especially if they're really, really young, like toddler age or, or you know, something like that, they never want to leave their father's side. And it's also another another example that the ultra gives. One is the 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 son to the father the other one is like a fire that's constantly going upwards by nature to its source so this is something that we spoke about previously as well this the nature of fire is it's always going upwards it's cleaving to its source which is above because the element of fire is high up it's um it's above and so the more that a person then so let's say it's like now you have such a person that again okay so they they were able to eradicate the clipos from within them to allow this natural innate love to come up and this will cause the person in their mind to think about God and to contemplate God to have a godly consciousness and this will lead to them desiring and wanting to be close to God and the more that a person does this the more that a person indulges in these uh, in these these meditations indulges in this type of thinking in their mind about yearning uh, towards God, this will cause that the yearning will extend not only in the mind, but it will extend 
also into their mouth and into their limbs so that they'll start talking about God. They'll start acting in godly ways. They'll start being involved in Torah and mitzvahs and to utilize these things, this Torah and mitzvahs to be able to, to cleave actually to God because we know the principle that God and his Torah are one and the same right? We've learned this many times. So the basic principle that they're saying here is like, that's the great power of meditation. I mean, we see this regular meditation, secular meditation too. It's like whatever you think about, whatever you meditate on, if you meditate on it enough, it's going to manifest in how you speak. What what you think about, basically plainly put, what you think about in your daily life, what you read, what you engage your mind and what you occupy your mind in is going to influence how you speak and how you behave. So if you think about godly ideas, then you will most likely be speaking in a godly way and acting in a godly way and act and and behaving and with uh, doing mitzvahs and engaging in Torah study and things like that. And you'll use these things to get closer to God. So now in regards to this type of yearning that we've been talking about the ultra risk says that there's a citation from Tehillim that is uh that parallels this that is related to this this comes from Tehillim chapter 42 verse 3 where it says Sama nafshi, nafshi so my soul thirsts for god so basically the ultra is saying that this type of yearning that we're describing can be likened to thirst just like it says the ultra a person who thirsts for water and still doesn't get the pleasure from it so it's like an unquenchable thirst it's somebody who's just like so thirsty so thirsty they're searching 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 for water but they they don't get that water so that's what this uh that's what this yearning is like and then the ultra goes on and he says now not only that but this yearning itself is something that we want to be taking out of hidden so we, we can yearn to yearn, basically. So we pray to God to ask God to help us take this yearning, take this this innate love out from um, out from from imprisonment and have it be manifest so that the heart will be filled with just it alone. So basically, it's like once we recognize that this is how ideally we want to be that we want to have this that we have this innate love within us that it's trapped within us that we want to do the right thing and that we have all these distractions and everything like that we're trying to overcome the distractions so it's like that's great if we actually could just eradicate those distractions but we're human after all and it's a really difficult battle so the ultra is telling us that we should actually pray to god and we should ask god to help us and should, we should yearn to yearn we should yearn to get to that level of thirst and when this uh, and we're praying to god that our heart should only desire these things that we shouldn't be distracted by these other things and the and that and such that now this is very poetic language the ultra but uses here he says and that the rival wife that Sarah it's called in Hebrew will not enter will not enter the home which is what's the rival wife so it's like you know in an imagery of like let's say you have like a, a woman married to a man and then there's this other woman that's going after the husband you know maybe like the husband's like potential mistress or whatever and it's like you do not want her to enter the home she is not allowed in. you don't want her to come into the home so what is that here what what is this rival wife who is the mistress in this um in this scenario this is the desires of the world so it's like we want to desire god we don't want to be distracted with the desires of the world and we're recognizing that the desires of the world are very alluring very appealing but that's it's not what we really want. So we're pushing those aside and we're asking God to help us with that. But rather we want our yearning to be just solely for the woman of the house. We want our soul yearning to be for God. So in this case, the yearning for God, we're calling the woman of the house, the, the wife, the true, the true mist, mistress, right? And she needs to be the one in charge. She needs to stand up for herself and she needs to kick out this rival wife, kick out this mis mistress outside at the very least in thought, speech and action. So we need to say like, okay, maybe, you know, we're not like we learned about in the first part of, of the Tanya, we can't all be Tzadikim. Tzadikim is somebody who, a Tzadik is somebody who has gained full dominion over this this extraneous mistress, this these outside forces, these desires, these these desires for anything that's not God they don't even crave things that are not God anymore that's that's what a tzaddik is so that may not be realistic for most of us so we may still have the temptations basically but at the very least what we can strive for is to at least not have these desires these temptations be manifest in thought speech or action and so 
we may not, says the ultra, but be able to totally eradicate her from our heart. But nevertheless, she should be hidden. This this ex- this mistress, this rival wife, should be hit. she should be the one that is in exile and in servitude to the mistress of the home, to the to the woman of the house, which is our true soul. And and uh, and when she's there, when she's in hiding, like when when this uh, this rival wife is in hiding, when this rival wife is in servitude, we can use her at times. We can actually make use of her. Why? But how can we use her? We can use her for things that are needed, like eating and drinking and things like that. As it says, and the altar Rabbi concludes with a citation from Mishle, chapter three, verse six, know him in all your ways. So meaning to say, so let me just explain that last little bit, a little bit here. So basically the altar Rabbi is saying that we have within us, as we've talked about many times, we have our godly soul. We have this, this, this true soul inside of us that's like the deepest part of our soul this part of ourselves that really wants nothing else but to cleave to god it does not want anything of this world it's it recognizes this world for the uh for the falsity that it is for the illusions that it is it does not it's sort of like after you eat a big meal and then you look at the plate and you just see like a bunch of bones and like crumbs and stuff like that it doesn't look appealing anymore it's like that's how the godly soul sees the physical world around us and we're calling that part of ourselves for the sake of today we're calling that the woman of the home the wife this, we are God's wife. That's we've many times we've talked about how we can be thought of to be as God's wife. But then we have another part of ourselves and we have another part of ourselves that is the uh, that is the animal soul. That's the part of ourselves that is associated with the klipos, the parts that conceal God. This is the part of ourselves that does get distracted by the things around us, that enjoys these physical pleasurable things, that likes the temptations, the distractions, the shiny lights and all that stuff. And for the sake of today, we're calling that part of ourselves, the rival wife or the mistress. And so what happens is we're here in this world and we embody these two things. And the and the wife, the true ruler of the home, the true um, woman of the house is in exile, unfortunately. She wants to be close to God. She wants to cleave to God. She wants to do God's will. But she is in servitude. She's in exile, imp- imprisoned by this rival wife who's in charge and having a good time, going out partying, whatever, eating whatever she wants, doing whatever she wants, saying whatever she wants, speaking lush and hara, gossip, whatever, you know, all kinds of different things, thinking whatever she wants. And until when we recognize what's going on and we say like, wait a second, this mistress, this is a rival wife. This is not my husband, meaning God's wife. This is just a mistress and we need to get her out of the house as soon as possible. And so we try really hard to fight her off. Sometimes maybe we can succeed to the extent for some people that she actually is kicked out entirely. And then the the woman of the house rises up and she is the sole person there. And then the whole desire is just for God and nothing else. Sometimes for most of us, we can't get rid of this rival wife entirely. She's still going to be there lingering to some extent. The best we can do, which is something that we all can do, is to gain control over her, to put her in her place. We can say, you know what? Okay, I get it. You're not leaving. You're stuck here. You're. We can't get rid of you, but you go here. You're going to be in this dungeon and we're just going to call you out at specific times as we need you you're going to serve us that we're the ones that are in charge and when do we call out this rival wife at specific times for eating for drinking for things like that that are necessary bodily functions that we need in order to survive which is where the rival wife really thrives because she loves physicality right but we need that physicality in order to exist and in order to do Torah and mitzvahs so we can kind of work together with her as long as she knows her place so that is the basic idea of today's Tanya and that's uh, that's hopefully gives you an insight into this second category of love, which is all about this unquenchable thirst for God that once again, we all innately have as Jews. It's just in hiding. And the proof of that really is the fact that even people, even Jews that are really far off, really don't do God's will, or really all of us when we sometimes slip up, the fact that we regret it, the fact that we have remorse is proof that we actually have this innate love of God within ourselves. And the goal is really the our, our work in life is to tap into it and to or to try as best as possible to fight off the extraneous forces that are hiding it, that are covering it up, and let that unquenchable thirst, that innate love that we have for God shine. So that's it for today. And we will continue tomorrow when we begin a new epistle, Epistle 19, and I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarit Switzer. 
This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzchak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.